He is his head trainer. He is the head trainer for not only Anthony Joshua, but the likes of Lee Wood as well. Shout out to Nottingham. He's the one and only Ben Davison. Kind enough to join us. There he is. Hello, Ben. How are you? Oh, good. Thank you. Yourself? Uh, I'm so I'm so good and uh, so happy to have you on. Really, it's a, it's a great honor to have you on and a great admirer of everything that you are doing in the uh, sweet science. Congratulations on the win. Uh, so much to talk to you about, but could I ask you this? When this idea was first floated to you, AJ's next fight after Otto Valin against Francis Ngannou, were you on board with this, or would you have preferred him go down a different path? Um, I think uh, I think AJ has said this himself. I think before the Fury fight happened, I think it was a fight that didn't really make sense, but being honest, I think post that fight, it was a fight that made sense. I think there was a lot of I'm not going to use the word hype because hype can sometimes be taken as um, unearned and not true, you know, but he put in a fantastic performance and showed that, and I genuinely do believe even now he's a credible world-class heavyweight, whether that's boxing or MMA. We, we briefly, briefly spoke about this in the, in the interview that I talked about, but I'd love to dig a little bit deeper um, as you were preparing for this fight, and a lot has been made of the way you prepare for fights um, for your fighters, Lee Wiley, who coaches with you as well, um, the way you guys study tape, how tricky of an experience was this? How challenging of an experience was it? Because you did have to, and this is what I respected about you guys, you did acknowledge looking at the MMA fights as opposed to maybe others who said, you can't look at that, there's nothing to be learned from that. Now you're crossing over into a different kind of sport. Yes, some elements are the same, but the uh, the tape isn't, quite the same as you're preparing for, you know, a big Lee Wood title fight. So what was that experience like for you as you guys really dug deep into the research? Yeah, like you say, there were some things that did cross over. There were some things that we couldn't really, um, couldn't really use or, or take much information from. Um, but of course, you know, there was only the one fight with, with, with Tyson Fury. So we had a little look at, at some of his other, UFC and mixed martial arts fights just to take a look and try and make sure that some things did cross over that, you know, we had evidence to back up. It wasn't just this fight that this tendency was happening. It happened here. It happened here. It happened here. So yeah, you know, Lee Wiley does a fantastic job. Um, unbelievable, a huge part of, of what we do. And um, yeah, we, we had a look across the board because like you say, there's lots of things that do cross over. Uh, what what are those, and perhaps what is that tendency that you're referring to? Just so, just a, a number of things. Um, what's his reaction when somebody jabs? What's his tendency when the distance opens up? When somebody repositions? Are there certain things that he does? And there were certain things that he done in the Tyson Fury fight that he also done in the same scenario in the MMA fight. So. Going into the Tyson fight, how did you think he was going to do? I'll be honest, I hadn't watched much of Francis Ngannou. I knew that he was this devastating puncher, big, strong guy. I heard a bit about his story. Um, you know, a phenomenal story, a phenomenal human being. I just I didn't know. First of all, straight away, the thing was the 10 round, you know. That was the first... That was the first thing that stood, stood out to me. I thought, you know, going into your first fight. Well, well, not first fight. That's the wrong way to put it. He's, he's a fighter. Um, he's a championship, world champion fighter. But just the format of the 10 frees with a minute's rest in between, um, without the, the long periods of potential grappling, if they come about, um, the concentration levels, these kind of things. Um, I thought it was going to be struggle for him to do the 10 rounds, but he proved me wrong in that first Tyson Fury fight. Um, and I th he shocked me if I'm being 100% honest he shocked me and I think he shocked the boxing world were you in the camp of oh Francis was tremendous or Tyson didn't take this seriously and that's why the fight played out the way in which it did I think there was a bit of both I think I know Tyson I used to work with Tyson so I don't think he ever prepared for a fight without without with a lack of professionalism however Sometimes you go into a fight or even a spa and your mindset is you have a lack of respect for the opponent. Even though you've prepared properly, you've done everything you've said that you will do. 
it's hard to then turn it on once you get in there and go, oh, actually, I need to have some respect for this opponent. It's hard to force that and fake that. Um, and I think that's what happened. I think Tyson went in there with a lack of respect with Francis. I think he prepared professionally. I think when he got in there, he didn't have that respect for him. But I think quickly it was a case of, oh, actually, I need to treat this guy with respect. And I think it's hard to then turn that on. Um but I also think that Francis is a phenomenal learner. I think he's proven time and time again with his story and his life and the way he's done things and defied odds over and over again. I think that he is the type of guy that just can pull these big moments out of the bag. And um, he boxed phenomenally well. And I truly do believe, I don't. Th- I know what happened on Friday night happened. I don't believe there's another heavyweight that does that to him, if I'm being honest, in boxing. Wow. Okay. And I don't want to ask you specifically about that, but just curious, um, you know, your, your first time working with AJ, was that the Jermaine Franklin fight or was it the Hellenius fight? No, it was the, um, Otto Wallen fight. It was the Otto Wallen fight. Wow. That was your first time. How, how long before, wow. For some reason I thought it was the Hellenius fight. Uh, how long before the Otto Wallen fight did you guys link up? Was it the beginning of the training camp? Or you, like, or well yeah, the, be- the beginning of the track. Well, after the Hellenius fight, he doesn't live too far from me, and they got in contact about potentially just using the gym to do a bit of training down the gym. Uh, he knows he's used one of the guys in my gym as a sparring partner. He knows a few of the guys that I coach from the GB squad that they've been friends for years. Again, he doesn't live far from the gym, so it was just a case of him using the gym. The Otto Wallen fight happened to come about. There wasn't much time of travelling back and forth to the UK. It was a short notice, and... Uh, you know, we decided, decided to, to work together for that fight and the rest is history. Did you have any kind of relationship beforehand? Uh, a, a little bit, a little bit. You know, again, he's quite local, so there's a few mutual friends, etc. cetera. Um, but nothing, nothing major. What did you make of the, the AJ that you are now going to link up with? Because um, I talked about it a lot last week. In August of 2022, when he lost Usyk for the second time, it looked like to a lot of people that he was done, that he was having maybe a mental, emotional breakdown. And I thought a lot of people, especially in the UK, were unfair to him because he had done such great things for the country and were just kicking him while he was down at his lowest moment. And then slowly but surely, he's building himself back up with the Franklin fight. The Every time out, he looks better and better. But he hadn't quite fought you know, top-level competition with all due respect to those guys. So the guy that you saw and met, as you say, okay, let's go for Otto Wallin, what did you make of that person that was you know, standing in front of you? Um, I think by the time, by the time the fight come about, there'd been a few conversations about certain scenarios, certain fights, which shown him a few clips. I think by the time the fight come about, there was a, a, a certain level of trust that he gave to us to be like, actually what these guys are saying is true and they've got evidence to back it up. So I can see why they're asking me to do or why they would want me to do what they're saying to do. So I was extremely confident from that point. He's extremely coachable. And I said to him, if you said to me that our first fight working together was Alexander Usyk and you trust what we're asking you to do, I'd be confident. I said to him that you will get out of these next this next fight with Otto Wallin, what you wanted to get out of the first two fights coming back from the, the Usyk defeats. And um, I'm confident that that's what he got. Um, again, we are only we only supplement what he able what what he's able to do. He's got this amazing tall bag. He's an Olympic gold medalist, the two time unified heavyweight champion of the world. All we help him do is just select the right tools for the job. And um he's extremely coachable, extremely professional. He's an absolute pleasure to work with. And that that combined um mix has, has led to, to these fantastic performances. Was there any concern on your part? Because let's be honest, he has bounced around a little bit as far as head trainers are concerned that you would give him so much that there would be this commitment on your end. And then after that fight, he would go back to someone else. No, no uh, and I wouldn't ever see that as being a problem. A fighter only has one career. And it's really important that they make the decisions that they feel hand on their heart is best for them. Sometimes it happens to be business wise that they make a change. Sometimes it's genuinely hand on their heart. They feel like they can make better improvements elsewhere. Whatever that reason is, if that's how a fighter feels, they only have one chance at one career. They need to do whatever they feel is right for them. So if a fighter ever wants to leave, you know, I never, ever have a problem with that. 
Uh, I've I've heard you say in interviews that you don't love the sort of like uh, rejuvenated AJ or the redempt all that. What, why do you not like those labels being put on him? Just because it's not put on him. Do you know what I mean? I think it, uh, what I don't like is when they almost try to say that we've rejuvenated AJ or anything like that because the work is his, the performances are his. There's only one man that steps in those ropes. We step out of them. So um, it's his hard work. It's him who's, you know, put under immense pressure and has to perform under the lights. And uh, it's him that's, that's going in there and doing it. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's all on him. You know, he, like I said numerous times, he's the ultimate professional and he's reaping the rewards from that. How are you feeling in the changing room on Friday before the fight? As as you're there, he's coming to the arena, you're gearing up. It's going to be like 3 o'clock in the morning as you guys walk. It's at an ungodly hour. How are you feeling? How are the nerves? What are you sensing from him? Yeah, I'm always pretty calm on fight night, to be honest. I think um, the, work, the work is almost done by that point. We know what we need to do. The fighter knows what he needs to do. And it's just a matter of case of going in there and executing. And... Um, when you've prepared properly and you've got a professional team with a professional fighter, you know, there is no reason for that not to happen. And um, I was extremely confident that if he went in there and done the right things, he was going to get a result and that's what he got. If, if we would have talked candidly before the fight, what was your feeling as far as how the fight would end and when it would end? Um... There was a few people I spoke to before and that since the fight, I can't say, oh, Ben actually told me off camera, etc. which, and I don't think Francis doesn't have a chin, but I don't think it had ever been tested properly to the extent that people were claiming it to be. I think he, he's, he is very tough. He, like, he's known for it, obviously, in the, the MMA world and um, he showed that in the, in the Tyson Fury fight as well. I just think no matter how good your chin is, when you're getting hit with punches that you can't see, by somebody like Anthony Joshua, no chin's going to hold up against that. And I just felt like that was the key, creating situations where he wouldn't see the punches. Um, you know, taking his mind elsewhere before hitting him with something else. That was the key, uh, making sure that he was reacting to something while being made to pay for something else. And um, I, I, I feel like AJ done a good job with that. What were you thinking when you saw him switch to Southpaw? We'd prepared for that and we knew that he would struggle to defend. If AJ done a couple of things beforehand to set a certain scenario up, he'd struggle to defend the right hand from a southpaw stance and that's what happened. I just think it was a, it was a mistake on his behalf. But I understand he's done that. Again, we had little looks at his MMA career. He's done that throughout his career as well. So um, that was something that we prepared for. And, and what is that scenario? When he switches to southpaw, what's the scenario that you can capitalize on? I'm not going to go into too many details, but um, we just knew that he would struggle to... He's not naturally a southpaw. We knew that if AJ done a few things and established a few things, it would make it hard for him to know where or when the punches are coming from, which would lead to AJ landing a flush right hand. And again, it doesn't matter how good your chin is. If AJ's hitting you flush with a right hand, you're going to go down. Do you, do you watch MMA? Are you are you a person who... Um, I, I, I watch some. I watch some. Um, I don't follow it religiously. I used to actually probably watch a little bit more Chuck Liddell days, okay. those, those sort of times. Um, but I, I, I know little bits and I watch some bits. The reason I ask is, as you may know, it's a lot more common for fighters to switch stances in MMA as opposed to boxing. Someone switches stances in boxing a lot is made. Terrence Crawford, like, oh, he, people go on and on about this in MMA as you say with Francis, like it's just more common. Why do you think that is? Why do you think in MMA people do it a lot more and it's just sort of ho-hum and in boxing you either really stick to orthodox or southpaw. It's very rare that someone will actively switch stances. I don't know. I, I imagine I imagine a lot of it is due to the leg kicks, I would imagine. Um, I think sometimes fighters that are able to switch in boxing, they would switch to maybe I want to create a bit more distance against this fighter or if it's naturally a southpaw versus orthodox, the distance is a little bit further. I might switch to be a little bit closer. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't know. You're probably better off asking a, uh, 
an MMA expert on that one. Fair enough. Um, what was so fascinating about not only AJ's reaction to the knockout, but your reaction, it was so businesslike. You do guys just go in there, fist bump, ain't no thing. He's walking around like he hardly even smiled. And meanwhile, sitting ringside, it was pretty scary. I- I've never seen Francis Rock knocked down, knocked out, and he was out for a minute or two, then the oxygen applied. Um, I know you, you're happy for your guy and all that, but for you, like, was that? Are, are you able to look at him, and is that one of the scarier knockouts that you've ever witnessed live? Yeah, I've, to be honest, I've, I've been in the corner of a couple of, of, uh, of bad knockouts, to be honest. Recently, I had um, one of my lads, Alois Jr., uh, with, a, with a devastating knockout, and... Yeah, after this knockout, we got in the ring and, as you say, me and AJ spotted, but we could see, obviously, Francis was out cold. So, always in that situation, number one, you're respectful. Two, you're concerned. Um, so, it's always, you want to be, obviously, there's the Leewood Mick Conlon one as well, where we celebrated before we understood that, he, it, you know, he was out cold. And then you want to, you know, it's concerning. It's concerning. So, um, you want to again be respectful but you want to make sure that everything's okay before you you look to celebrate and enjoy it uh yeah the the conlon knockout was one of the scarier ones but i i love the way you and lee all handled it after you you recognized just how scary it was him falling out of the ring like that um and so you would you would tell francis like if, if he asked you to to keep pursuing this to not stop doing it you think that he can have success Maybe not against the upper echelon at this juncture, but against some of the other guys in the heavyweight division. Yeah, you got to think like who he's gone up against in his first couple of fights. Like, I think if he was to drop it down a level, I think he uh, even even at the level that he's at, he got caught with a shot. I think he'd be a handful. I think he'll be a handful for anybody. Um, and if I'm honest, when he come out in round one, I could see. And I, I haven't spoke to his team, but I can assure you that they would say he made tremendous improvements from the first boxing match to the second. I know it doesn't look that way because of the end result, but I can assure you that's what they would say because I could see it. Even as quick as the fight was ended and what happened happened, I could see from the offset he made massive improvements from the first fight to that fight. And I think he continually needs to make improvements because he's that type of character and I've got a hell of a lot of respect for him. What did you notice in that brief moment that made you feel like he had improved greatly? Just his base, his legs seemed a lot better. His posture seemed a lot better. Um, he had a little bit more tempo about him in moments. Um, again, I know it was a brief period, but just those, those things there showed me signs of improvements instantly. Do you think this should end the MMA boxing crossover fights? or Again, and, and I tried to say this to Francis uh, after the post-fight press conference that he deserves a hell of a lot of respect because he said something at the press conference, and I have to, I have to back him on this. If any of these guys were to step into the cage with him, it's game over. They have one chance and one shot to land a clean shot, and if they don't and he gets a hold of them, it's over. Um. I understand a big part of France's game was his sta- is his stand up game, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, I think so. Therefore, it, it does make a little bit more sense for him coming across the box in. And again, you know, look, it's fantastic. He's done fantastic business and changed his his family and his future fa- next generation of family's life um, financially. So, really pleased for him in that sense. But I understand there must be a certain element of frustration knowing that if it was to, that these guys were to go into the cage, you know, he would be the one with the advantages. Uh, there's a very famous MMA fighter, one of the greatest ever, named Demetrius Johnson. Uh, he's one of the most decorated champions in UFC history, who has said uh, since that fight that he thinks AJ beats Francis in an MMA fight. What do you think of that? Well, it depends if there was to stand up, not to say he couldn't, if there was to stand up, but if it was to go to the ground and, you know, AJ was to have, I don't know if he's ever done any jujitsu or any work like that, but you would favour Francis in that scenario. If there was to stand off each other in the cage, then you probably would still 
favour Anthony Joshua. What I mean by what I was saying was there must be an element of frustration knowing Francis, like I've stepped across to your world. Right. Um, and I know previously there has been um, Tim Sylvia, James Tony stepped across into the into the um, into the octagon, but you know I know as of late Conor McGregor stepped across, Nate Diaz has stepped across, Francis Ngannou has stepped across, and uh, so far none of the guys have, have done the same back, and I don't blame them to be honest. Yes, although I do think that he beat Tyson Fury on October twenty eighth, but that's neither here nor there. It was a close one. Um, but you yeah, know. No, 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 this is this this is what I was saying. Like, uh, hand on my heart, I genuinely do think he will be an issue for all of the heavyweights. Right. Um, so obviously, I know that uh, this is up to AJ and Eddie, but just curious your thoughts as well. There's an interesting thing now to to deal with because we know that Tyson and, and Alexander Usyk are fighting on May 18th. Tyson Fury has told me multiple times that there is a rematch clause both ways, regardless of what happens. So that means by the time AJ gets his shot at the winner and he is that guy, we're talking probably 2025. Would you like for him to just wait or would you like to, to see him remain active and fight someone in the interim? I don't know. We'll have to play it by ear. I think what's important is that no decision gets made before May 18th. The reality is, I know there's a rematch clause, but if that fight, if that fight is a conclusive, one-sided fight, either way, where people aren't overly interested in in the um, in the rematch, there might be a chance for Anthony Joshua to to fight the winner of that fight. So, I think we have to sit tight for the moment and then play it by ear post May 18th. Do you have a preference, a trilogy against Usyk or? the one we've been talking about seemingly for a decade, him versus Tyson? No, I don't have a preference. Um, again, like what you said, post after the victory, just seeing business is strictly business, you know, and uh, we'll see May 18th how, how the how the land lies and um, the, heavyweight, the heavyweight landscape can constantly change. So, yeah, Francis put himself in there off of one, one performance against Tyson Fury. So again, like I say, the landscape can always change, especially in the heavyweight division. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how it's lying after May 18th. Just curious, given your previous working relationship with Tyson, would that be awkward for you? We'll have to see. We'll <laughs> have to see. Look, there's a lot of love and respect there. I saw him before the fight. Um, no hard feelings. You know, like I say, there's a hell of a lot of respect there. Um, so yeah I still don't get that one I'm sure you want to plead the fifth and, and, and move on things are going great for you I, that, that one still will forever baffle me why you guys didn't stick together well this is boxing like I said earlier you know, for whatever reason fighters and trainers and coaches and managers and promoters you know relationships are always breaking down business wise doesn't mean they have to break down and there has to be a fallout and calling each other bad names. You know, there should always be a level of integrity in, 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 in my, um, in my belief and a level of respect. And, uh, I, I hope to think that any fighter that's previously worked with me feels like there's been that from my side. And I, I like to feel like there's been that from their side as well. That's important to me. Safe to assume you're, you're, you're sticking with AJ, AJ sticking with you. You guys are going to keep on doing this. Like I say, you know, I, I can't make any decisions for him. This is uh, it's boxing. People come, people go. Um, I never hold any grudges against any fighter that wants to wants to move on and wants to work with someone else and explore other things. So every relationship in boxing is fight by fight. So um, it'd be a pleasure to carry on working with him. But again, it's you know, it's it's not for me to to assume or or make these commitments for him. Well, that would be an even greater shocker if uh, that didn't continue. So I feel like, I feel like you're in a good spot. Uh, two last very quick ones, if I may. Uh, what about my guy, Lee Wood? Is his next fight going to be at the city ground or not? What are we doing here? What, what, like, what's taking so long? The city ground next fight is off the table, ah, unfortunately. Um, that's not going to happen. So we had some bad news there. We're currently looking at what, what options we have. Um, I think Lee's going to have a meeting with Eddie, um, but he's also now a free agent, so he can explore some other options as well. So 
news coming on Lee Wood. Do you have concerns about Ryan Garcia? Obviously, uh, you know, you work with Devin and he speaks very highly of the work you and Lee Wiley have done for him to get him to this point. There's some concern about Ryan. Do you have concern about him? Um, I don't think we're in a position to be able to concern ourselves with Ryan. We have to be professional and focus and just be committed to the fight going ahead because we can't get caught slipping, as we would say. Um, it's important that we just stay focused, prepare as though Ryan's going to turn up as the best Ryan that's ever been. And, um, you know, he's, he's a high level operator, he's, he's a top quality fighter. So, Maybe he's trolling us. Maybe yeah. he's trying to trick us. So, you know, our job is to, to remain professional. And again, Devin Haney, ultimate professional. Um, from the first day that I met him, um, I was very, very impressed with his mentality, his mindset, uh, his eagerness to improve. And um, again, he's, another, he's, he's a pleasure to work with. And he's, he's a true professional himself. So I know that he'll be prepare, preparing properly. We're doing our work preparing properly. And um, it's on Ryan to, to do the same. Okay, sorry. One last quick one, if I may. It's the biggest one of all. The biggest question that I can ask you here today, and then we'll say goodbye. Who do you got, Jake Paul or Mike Tyson? Um, <laughs> so is this an exhibition? Uh, my understanding is they haven't quite finalized that. They want it to be a pro bout. It is not true that there will be headgear. It will be a regular boxing bout. The questions that need to be answered are pro bout or not the 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 rounds the amount of rounds and also um the weight i think will be heavyweight but uh, those are the two big ones and, and what they would like for it to be is a pro bout so it's, it's going to be 10 ounce gloves no head guard no head guard yeah i don't know about the gloves just yet 10 or 12 but uh oh. that yeah how do you feel about this somebody put something the other day where Although me personally am disappointed and wouldn't, don't want to see this, who am I to tell Mike Tyson that I'm disappointed on his own life decisions? Mm. I'm nobody. So he will have his own reasons as to why he's going ahead with this. He's a very, very smart man, a very wise man. And I trust that even if we are blind to it and cannot see it, and if it was to go wrong for him, we would, well, a lot of people would point and laugh and, and say, what did he do this for? We may never know the answers as to the true reasons behind why he's doing this. I trust that he knows why he's doing it and that he is making the right decision for himself for whatever reason it is that he's doing it. Personally, I wish it wasn't happening. However, you know, I, I respect and trust in, in the decisions that he makes in his own life. He's, he's a wise man, a smart man. And um, I just wish him the best. And I hope that whatever reason it is that he's doing it, he manages to um, fulfill whatever it is that he's looking to fulfill by, uh, by, by going ahead with his fight. Fair enough. Respect that. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much for coming on. Great to have you on. Great to pick your brain. Congrats Pleasure. on all your success. And uh, I hope it continues for a very long time. Good luck with the upcoming fights. Uh, appreciate you giving us some time and uh, waxing poetic on all of this and uh, a little bit of insight into how you got it done. It's fascinating to me. So great stuff. And I appreciate it very much. No pleasure. Thank you. And to you and all your success as well. Thank you so much. There he is, Coach Ben Davison, the head man for the likes of Anthony Joshua. He was there. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it very much. Hey, if you like this video, give us the old thumbs up. Subscribe as well. You can get many more of these videos on the channel. So please do that. We would love you forever if you did so.